morning. Good morning, excellence. questions, whatever questions you may have, make comments. Morning. How is everybody doing this morning? I'm about to bake some bagels for your amusement and education. You're welcome. I need to add honey to the water. Fill it up to about here. I'm going to turn down the heat on the, uh, on the pot. Um, I want a nice, slow, consistent boil. So I put it on about medium heat. 
My oven's at about 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And my flame, I've set the flame to about a medium flame. Medium. The dial that goes up to five, that's about three. back flame is set a little bit lower because the back of the oven is hotter than the front of the oven. I should say that's a clean bagel. We make other kinds of bagel. So I'm adding 30 bagels to the water. Splash myself in the face. It's one of the perils of working here is uh, I burn myself or splash myself, or I get slippers. It's a mean job. I get the boards nice and wet so they so the bagels don't stick and also so the bo the boards don't burn um, as rapidly in the oven as I mean they still burn but uh, obviously getting them wet slows down the bur burning that might occur. Those watching at home might be wondering why I'm doing this in silence. Well, it's because I often recite poetry to myself. Such as the Pied Piper of Hamelin by Robert Browning. 
Hamlet towns and Brunswick, like famous Hanover City, the river lesser deep and wide washes its wall on the southern side. A pleasanter's quad you never spied, but when begins my ditty, almost five hundred years ago, to see the towns for supper so, strong vermin must pity. Rats, they clawed the dogs and killed the cats and bit the babies in the cradles and ate the cheeses from the vats and licked the soup from the croaks old ladles. Split open the kegs of salt and scraps, made nests for men's Sunday hats, and even spoiled the women's chats by drowning out their speaking, for shrieking and squeaking in fifty different sharps and flats. At last, the people in a body to the town hall came flocking. Tis clear, cried they, our mayor is a naughty, and as for our corporation, shocking, to think we buy gowns lined with ermine, for dolts who can't or will determine what's best to rid us of our vermin. You hope because you are old and obese to find in the furry civic robes ease. Rouse up, sirs, give your brains a racking to find the remedy we are lacking. We're sure as fate will send you packing. At this the mayor and corporation quaked with the mighty consternation. An hour they sat in council. At length the mayor broke silence. For a gilder I'd my urban gown sell. I wish I were a mile hence. It's easy to bid one rack one's brain. I'm sure my poor head aches again. I scratch it so, but all in vain. Oh, for a trap, a trap, a trap. Just as he said this, what should have at the chamber door but a gentle tap? Bless us, cried the bear. What's that with the corporation as he sat, looking little through wondrous fat? Nor brighter were his eyes, nor moister than a too long open oyster, save when at noon his paunch grew mutinous, for plate of turtle green and glutinous. Only a scraping of shoes on a mat, anything like a sound of a rat makes my heart go pit and pat. Come in, cried the mayor, looking bigger, and in did come the strangest figure. His long queer coat from heel to head was half yellow and half red, and he himself was tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin, and light loose hair and swarthy skin, nor tuft of hair on cheek, nor beard on chin. But lips were smile without him in. There was no guessing his kith or kin. And nobody could enough admire this tall man in his quaint attire. Quote fun, it's as my great grandsire, starting up at the trump of doom's tone, I walk this way from his painted tombstone. He advanced towards the council table, and please, your honor, said he, I am able, by means of secret charm, to draw all the creatures living beneath the sun, the crawler, swim, or fly, or run after me so as you never saw. And I chiefly use my charm on creatures that do people harm. The mole and toad and newton viper, the people call me the pied piper. And here they notice round his neck, a scarf of red and yellow stripe, to match with his coat of self-same check. And at scarf's end hung a pipe. His fingers, they notice, were ever slain, as if impatient to be flame. Upon this pipe, as low as dangled, over his vesture so old fangled. Yes, said he, pied piper as I am, in Tartari I fred the camp, last June of his huge swarms of gnats. I eased in Asia the Nizam of a monstrous of vampire bats. And as for what your brain bewilders, if I rid your town of rats, will you give me one thousand guilders? One fifty thousand was the exclamation of an astonished mayor and corporation. Into the street the piper stepped, smiling first a little smile, as if he knew what magic slept in his quiet pipe the while. Like a musical adept to blow his pipe and give the wrinkle, and green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled, like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled. And there three shrill notes the pipe uttered, you heard as if a farming muttered, and a muttering grew to a grumbling, and a grumbling grew to a mighty rumbling, and out of the houses came the rats tumbling. Great rats, small rats, green rats, brawny rats, brown rats, black rats, gray rats, tawny rats, gray old potters, gay young sisters, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, cocking tails and pricking whiskers, families by tens and dozens, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, fall in the pipe for their lives. From street to street he piped advancing, and step for step they followed dancing, until they came to the river Wesser, where it all plunged and perished save one who stout as Julius Caesar, swam across and lived to carry, as even manuscript he cherished, to rat lamp home his commentary, which was, at first shrill notes up the pipe. I heard a sound as of scraping tripe, and putting apples wondrous ripe into the side of presses bright, and a moving away of people 
top boards, and the leaving a jar of conserved cupboards, and a drawing the corpse of train oil flasks, and a breaking the hoops of butter casks, and it seemed as if a voice sweeter far than my heart with my solary and greed called out, O oh, rats, rejoice, the world has grown to a vast dry saltery, so munch on, crunch on, take your nunch on, breakfast, supper, dinner, lunch on, and just as a bulky sugar punch on, already stayed like a great sun shone, gracious scarce an inch before me, just as me thought it said come for me, I found the wesson rolling over me. You should have heard the hamlet people ring the bells till they rock the steeple. Go, cried the mare, and get long poles, poke out the nest and lock up the holes, consult with carpenters and builders, and leave in our town not even a trace of the rats. When suddenly up the face of the pipe of perk in the marketplace, the first of your keys, like thousand guilders, a thousand guilders, the mayor looked blue, so did the corporation too, for council dinners made rare havoc, with Claire A, who sell vin to grab hawk, and half the money would be punished, their seller's biggest butt of Rhenish, to pay this sum to a wandering fellow, with gypsy coat and bread and yellow. Besides, quoth the mayor with a knowing wink, our business was done at the river's brink, we saw with our eyes the vermin sink, and what dead can't come to life, I think. So, friend, we are not folks to shrink from our duty of giving you something to drink, and a matter of money to put in your coat. But as for the gilders, what we spoke of them, as you well know, was a joke. Besides, our losses have made us thrifty. A thousand gilders, come to take fifty. The piper's face fell and he cried, no trifling, I can't wait beside. I promise visit by dinner time, Baghdad, and accept the prime of the head cook's potage. Always. It's a poem. Obviously, obviously you don't know what I'm saying. It's a poem by Robert Browning. Perfect. Where was I? The piper's face fell and he cried, no trifling, I can't wait beside. I promise to visit by dinner time Baghdad and accept the prime of the head cook's potage. All these rich in, for having left in the caliph's kitchen of a nest of scorpions, no survivor. With him I prove no bargain driver. With you don't think I'll bait the stiver. And folks who put me in a passion, they find me pipe after another fashion. How, cried the mayor, do you think I brook being worse treated than a cook? Insulted by a rival, with idle pipe and vesture piebald. Threaten us, fellow, do your worst. Blow your pipe there till you burst. Once more he stepped into the street, and to his lips again laid his long pipe with smooth straight cane. And ere he blew three notes, such sweet soft notes as yet musicians cunning never gave the enraptured air. There was a rustling, it seemed like a bustling, of merry crowds justling, of pitching and hustling. Small feet were pattering, wooden shoes clattering, little tongues, little hands clapping, and little tongues chattering, and like foals in a farmyard with barley and scattering, out came the children running, all the little boys and girls, with rosy cheeks and flax and curls, and sparkling eyes and teeth like pearls, tripping and skipping ran merrily after, the wonderful music was shouting and laughter. The mayor was dumb and the council stood as if they were changed into blocks of wood. Unable to move a step or cry to the children merrily skipping by, could only follow with an eye that joyous crowd at the piper's back. And how the mayor was on the rack and the wretched council's bosoms beat as the piper turned from the high street to where the west had rolled its waters, right in the way of their sons and daughters. How he turned from south to west and to cop over a kill his steps addressed. After him the children pressed, great was the joy in every breast. He never can cross the mighty top, he forced to let the piping drop, and we shall see our children stop. When lo, they reached the mountainside, a wondrous portal opened wide, as if a cavern was suddenly hollowed, the piper advanced and the children followed. And when all were in to the very last, the door in the mountainside shut fast. Did I say all, oh, no one was lame, and could not dance the whole of the way. And in after years, if you blame the sadness, he was used to say, it is dull in our towns that my playmates 
left. I can't forget your eye for rap. Of all the pleasant sights they see, which the piper also promised me. For he led us, he said, to a joyous land, joining the town in jest at hand, where waters gushed with fruit trees grew, and flowers before the fairer hue. And everything was strange and new. The sparrow was brighter than peacock here, and their dog outran ran our fellow deer, and honeybees had lost their stings. And horses were born with eagles' wings, and just as I became assured, my lame foot would be speedily cured. The music stopped, and I stood still, and found myself outside the hill, unle unable to move a step or cry to the children, left behind against my will, to go now limping as before, and never hear of that country more. Alas, alas, for Hamelin, there came into many a burger's pate, a text which says that heaven's gate opes to the rich at as easy rate, as the needle's eye takes the camel in. The mare sent east, west, north, and south to offer the piper by word of mouth, wherever it was men's lot to find him, silver and gold to his heart's content, if only he'd return the way he went and bring the children behind him. But when they saw it was lost endeavor, the piper and dancers were gone forever. They made a decree that lawyers never should think their records dated duly, if after the day of the month and year, these words do not as well appear. And so long after what happened here on the 22nd of July, 1376, and the better in memory to fix the place of the children's last retreat, they called it the Pied Piper Street, where anyone playing Piper Tabor was sure for his future to lose his labor, nor suffered they hostile or tavern to shock with mirth the street so solemn. And opposite the place of the cavern, they wrote the story on a column, and on a great church window painted, the same to make the world acquainted, how their children were stolen away, and there it stands to this very day. Poetry should be a part of people's everyday life. And that is what I hope to accomplish. My show, Morning Excellence, with Steve L. Poetry. Nobody hears poetry anymore. Poetry is key to our survival. Pretty soon, artificial intelligence will be writing poetry that's better than ours. So we need to step up our poetry game. with artificial intelligence now, my bros. <laughs> the heart asks pleasure first, and then excuse from pain, and then those little animal dyings that deaden suffering, and then to go to sleep. And then, if it should be the will of its inquisitor, the liberty to die. We beam through some things together, with trunks of memories still to come. We fell them through stormy weather. Long may you run up. Long may you run. Long may you run. Although these changes may have come to grow our child.
one day God said, this is what I'll do. I'll send down my son, I'll send him down to you to clear up this huppity bumpity hallabaloo. His name will be Christ and he'll never wear shoes. His friends will all call him the king of the Jews. He didn't come in a plane, he didn't come in a jeep, he didn't come in the pouch of a high jumping trophy. He rode on the back of the black Sassatoon, the blackiest creature you ever could view. He rode into Jerusalem, home of the king, home of the grumpy Jews, where false prophets were worshipped, some even in twos. There was Murray von Murr and Genghis Bobus, the one you could worship taking a snooze. Christ spoke from a mound, which is a pile of ground, and people gathered around without making a sound. Thus he spake, Sin in socks, socks full of sin. How, how do we quiet this Jehovah din? Do unto others as others do unto you. That includes you, Timothy Poo. And one Pharisee said to another, he knew, What shall we do about this uppity Jew? Wash him in wine and make him all clean and into Sam Biddle's crucifixion machine. Twirl the whirl and release the gablees, and in go the nails as fast as you please. And it said, he said as he bled, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do, because they walk through this world in two crappity shoes. Do you? Amen.
For those who are just joining us, uh, for me, I'm baking bagels. I have two batches in the oven and one in the pot. the bagels so that they uh, are the prime prime area of the oven so that they brown nice and evenly.
My first thought was he lied in every word. That hoary cripple with malicious eye, asking to watch the working of his lie on mine. And mouth scarce able to afford suppression of the glee that cursed and scored its edge at one more victim gained thereby. What else should he be set for? What else should he be set there for? What else should he be set for with his staff? What save to waylay with his lies and snare all the travelers that might find him posted there? And ask the road, I guess what skull-like laugh would break, what crutch can write my epitaph? For pastime in the dusty thoroughfare. If at his counsel I should turn aside and in, into ominous tract where all agree hides the dark tower, yet acquiescingly. Yet acquiescingly. I turn as I turn as he pointed. Neither pride nor hope rekindling at the end described, so much as gladness at some end might be. For what with my whole worldwide wondering? What with my search drawn through the years? My hope dwindling as a ghost, not fit to cope with the obstreperous joys, joy success would bring. I hardly tried to rebuke the spring my heart made, finding failure in its scope.
first thought was who died in every word, that hoary cripple with malicious eye, Askins to watch the working of his lie, on mine, and mouth scarce able to afford, suppression of the glee, that one the person scored the edges, the person scores, scored the edge, that one more victim gained thereby. What else should he be set for with his staff? What save to waylay with lies his snare all the travelers that might find him posted there? And ask the road, I guess what skull like laugh would break? What crutch can write my epitaph for pastime in the dusty thoroughfare? If that is counsel, I turn aside. I turn it, I should turn aside into into ominous tract where all agree hides where all agree hides the dark tower, yet acquiescingly I turn as he pointed. Neither pride nor hope rekindling at the end described, so much as gladness that, that some end might be. For what with my whole world wide wondering? What with my search drawn through years? My hope dwindling. My hope dwindling as a ghost not fit to cope. The obstreperous joy, joy that success would bring. I hardly tried to rebuke the spring. My heart made finding failure in its scope. failure in its scope. Love of mine, someday you will die. But I'll be close behind. I'll follow you into the dark. No blinding light, our tunnels to gain some light. Just our hands clasped so tight, waiting for the king of the spark. Heaven and hell aside, they both are satisfied. Illuminate the nose in their vacancy sign. There's no one beside you when your soul embarks. I'll follow you into the dark.
Catholic school is vicious of Roman rule. I got my knuckles bruised by a lady in black. She told me, son, I held my tongue. She told me, son, fear is the heart of love, so I never looked back. Heaven and hell aside, they both are satisfied. Illuminate the nose on their vacancy signs. If there's no one beside you when your soul embarks, I'll follow you into the dark. You and me have seen everything to see, from Bangkok to Calgary, and the soles of our shoes are worn down. But it's nothing to cry about, because we'll hold each other soon in the blackest of rooms. Heaven and hell decide, they both are satisfied. Illuminate the nose on their vacancy signs. If there's no one beside you, when your soul embarks, I'll follow you into the dark. What is DSP, amigo? These are almost gluten-free bagels I'm putting on the board. Almost gluten-free, my favorite, by the way. We make awesome almost gluten-free bagels. Thank you for your comments. I try to I try to watch the feed, but uh, I get distracted easily. Bacon sprinkles. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I, um, I wouldn't eat it. A bagel with bacon sprinkles on it, just mostly because I'm a, vegan, uh, I'm a vegetarian though, so. Uh, maybe, maybe if it had vegan bacon sprinkles on there. <laughs> no, I don't think I'd eat it anymore. I think I'd be less likely to eat it if I had vegan vegan bacon sprinkles. There's a, there's a really good donut shop downtown called Cartem's um, in Vancouver here. And they, they make donuts with bacon on top. I can't remember what the flavor is. Uh, I think they have donuts with sausage in them too. It's, uh, 
But their donuts are so good, so, so good. The best donuts you can eat. In Vancouver, anyways. I don't know, there's a few good places. There's, um, there's Two Daughters Bake Shop here in Lonsdale. That, uh, they, make, they make a really good vegan gluten-free donut. JJ Bean, they make the best, the best gluten-free muffin you can eat. Like, hands down. It's like a cupcake, but you know, whatever. I'm sure it's, you know, it's not very healthy, but it's delicious. It's so, so delicious. Yes, keep that in mind. It, it's a. Uh, it's well, if you, if you live in Vancouver, it's, it's definitely something you should seek out on at least a monthly basis. I, I, I have one every week. I go to JJ Bean and I get, I get their fruit cup and their gluten-free muffin. And that is breakfast. That is breakfast. Dese uno. Dese uno. Um, it's it's boiling water with about uh, just under a liter of honey, and then uh, I, that's what I boil the the bagels in. Um, I don't currently have any bagels in the in the pot, but uh, I have two batches in the, in the oven right now. But I, I just put almost gluten free in the oven, and almost gluten free takes a little bit longer to bake, so I'm gonna I'm not gonna put anything in the pot um, because then that would cause a a traffic jam, so to speak. It would cause some gridlock in the oven, and uh, gridlock in the oven is a bad thing, because that's when things start to burn. Um, on a busy day, uh, I, I, may, I can make up to 1,500 bagels. Um, I bake for 10 hours a day, or well, 10 to 11 hours a day. So I start at, I start at 4 o'clock, and I usually end my shift at about 3 o'clock. The afternoon, um, but that I only work four days a week, so I work uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and I have three days off. Three, Trace, Trace Diaz, which is uh, which is a nice benefit of working here. I like. Yeah, yeah, a four day week is, uh, yeah, three days off. It's hands down. They're, they're weekdays, though. I have, to, I have to work the weekend because um, that's our busiest time of the week. Saturday and Sunday. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are our busiest days here. So I, uh, I'm, I'm the most experienced baker here right now, so I, uh, I, work, the, I, big, I work the big days here. But on, a, on an average day, on a slower day, I do about a thousand bagels. And then there's, uh, obviously there's a lot of cleanup involved with a job like this, so I try to do extra cleanup. My favorite bagel is the almost gluten-free, rock salt. Cinnamon apple, but uh, my uh, ironically, my family has a history of celiacs and celiac, and um, I try to. I, I haven't been diagnosed celiac, but I don't eat a lot of gluten. 
I don't avoid it, but I just don't, I don't eat it very often. And uh, I choose, I choose gluten-free more often than I choose things. But our, our almost gluten-free is, um, oh, sorry, I missed that one. Um, I know, it's, it's satisfying in a way that bagels can only be, in a way that bagels are satisfying. has everything you could want in a bagel. A nice, a nice hard crust with a, a nice hard golden crust with a nice soft chewy inside. That's, that's, what, that's what you want with a bagel, right? And uh, you can achieve that using gluten-free ingredients, so it's not a huge, hole in my life, not eating. I know what a, I know what a good bagel looks like though. Because I've baked a lot of them. Yeah, um, I usually try to limit myself to one a day though. Uh, you know, There's no harm in one a day, or even two a day. I can handle two a day.
Hamlet towns and runs like my famous Hanover City. The river, lesser deep and wide, washes its ball on the southern side. A pleasant spot in every spine. All when begins my ditty almost 500 years ago to see the townsfolk suffer so from burning must be. Rats, they fought the dogs and killed the cats and bit the babies in the cradles and ate the cheeses from the bats and licked the soup from the cooks on ladles, split open the kegs of salted sprats, made nests in the men's Sunday hats, and even spoiled the women's chats by drowning out their speaking and shrieking and squeaking in fifty different sharks and flats. At last, the people in a body through the town hall came flocking. Tis clear, cried they, our mayor is a naughty, and as for our corporation, shocking, I think we buy gowns lined with ermine, for adults who can't or won't determine what's best to rid us of our vermin. You hope because you are old and obese, find in the furry civic robes ease, rouse up, sirs, give your brains a racking, find the remedy we are lacking, for sure as fate will send you cracking. At this, the merit corporation quaked with mighty consternation. An hour they sat in council. At length, the mayor broke silence. Poor a gilder knife by her brown cell. I wish I were a mile hence. It's easy to bid one back one's brain. I'm sure my heart, I'm sure my head aches again. I scratch it so, but all in vain. Oh, for a trap with trap with trap. Just as he said this, what should have? At the chamber door, but a gentle tap. Bless us, cried the mayor, what's that? With the corporation as he sat, looking little through wonder his fat. Nor brighter were his eyes, nor moister than a too long open oyster, save what I knew in his posture muteness, for a plate of turtle green and glutinous, only a scraping of shoes on a mat. Anything like the sound of a rat makes my heart go pit a pat. Come in, cried the mayor, looking bigger, and in did come the strangest figure. His long clear coat from heel to head was half yellow and half red, and he himself was tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin, and light loose hair and swarthy skin, nor tuft of hair on cheek, nor beard on chin. But lips or a smile went out and in. There was no guessing his kith or kin, and nobody could enough admire this tall man in his quaint attire. Quoth one, it's as my great grandsire, starting up at the trump of doom's tone, had walked his way from his painted tombstone. He advanced towards the council table, and please, Your Honor, said he, I am able, by means of secret charm, to draw all the creatures living beneath the sun, the crawler, swim, or fly, or run, after me so as you never saw. And I chiefly use my charm on creatures that do people harm, the mole and toad and newt and viper, and people call me the Pied Piper, and here they notice round his neck a scarf of red and yellow stripe, to match with his coat of self-stained check, and that scarf's end hung a pipe. And his fingers in the were ever swaying, as if impatient to be playing upon this pipe, as low it dangled over his vesture so old fangled. Yes, said he, Pied Piper as I am, in Tartari I fred the can, last June from its huge swarms of gnats. I eased in Asia the nice dam of a monstrous brood of vampire bats. And as for what your brain bewilders, if I rid your town of rats, will you give me one thousand guilders? One. Fifty thousand was the exclamation of an astonished bear and corporation. Into the street the piper stepped smiling first a little smile, as if he knew what magic slept in his quiet pipe the while. Like a musical adept to blow his pipe, his lips he wrinkled, and green and blue his sharp eyes twinkled, like a candle flame where salt is sprinkled. An air, an air three shrill notes the pipe uttered, you heard as if an army muttered, and the muttering grew to a grumbling, the grumbling grew to a mighty rumbling, and out of the houses came the rats tumbling, great rats, small rats, lean rats, brawny rats, Brown rats, black rats, gray rats, tawny rats, grave old plotters, gay young fishers, fathers, mothers, uncles, cousins, cocking tails and pricking whiskers, families by tens and dozens, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, followed by Piper for their lives, until they came to the street street, he piped advancing, and step for step they followed dancing, until they came to the River Wesser, where it all plunged and perished, save one who stout as Julius Caesar, swam across and lived to carry as he the manuscript he cherished, to Ratland home his commentary, which was, that first shell note of his pipe, I heard the 
where the sound notes of scraping trite, and putting apples wondrous bright into the side of presses bright. And it seems as if in moving away of pickled tough boards, and are leaving a jar of concert cupboards, and then drawing the corks of train oil flasks, and then breaking the hoops of butter casks. And it seemed as if a voice, sweeter far than by harp or by solary is breathed, called out, O oh, rats, rejoice, the world has grown to a vast dry saltery. So munch on, crunch on, take your nunch on, breakfast, supper, dinner, lunch on, and just as a bulky sugar punch on, already stayed like a great sun shone. Gracious, scarce to me, morning, just as me thought it said, come for me, I found the western rolling over me. You should have heard the Hamlet people ring the bells till they rocked the steeple. Go, cried the mare, get long poles, poke out the nests and block up the hole. Consult with carpenters and builders. We leave in our town not even a trace of the rats. When suddenly up the face of the piper perk from the marketplace, the first, if you please, my thousand guilders. A thousand guilders, the mayor looked blue, so did the corporation too. For council dinners made wear havoc with Clare Abel, Sal, Vin de Graaf, Pop. And half the money would replenish their seller's biggest butt of Rhenish to pay the sum to a wandering fellow with gypsy coat of red and yellow. Besides, quoth the mayor with a knowing wink, our business was done at the river's brink. We saw with our eyes the vermin sink, and what's dead can't come to life, I think. So, friend, we are not folks to shrink from our duty of giving you something to drink in a matter of money to put in your poke. But as for the guild is what we spoke of them, as you well know, was a joke. Besides, our losses have made us thrifty. A thousand builders, come, take fifty. The piper's face fell and he cried, No trifling, I can't wait beside. I promised to visit by dinner time Baghdad, and accept the prime of the head cook's potage, all he's rich in, for having left in the caliph's kitchen. Of a nest of scorpions, no survivor. With him I prove no bargain driver. With you don't think I'll bait the skyver. And folks who put me in a passion, may find me pipe after another fashion. How, cried the mayor, do you think I broke, being worse treated than a cook, insulted by our rivals, with idle pipe and vesture piebald? Threaten us, fellow, do your worst, blow your pipe there till you burst. Once more he stepped into the street, and to his lips again laid his long pipe of smooth straight cane, and there he blew three notes, such sweet soft notes as yet musicians cunning never gave the enraptured air. There was a rustling that seemed like a bustling, a very crowd jostling, a pitching and hustling. Small feet were pattering, wooden shoes clattering, little hands clapping, and little tongues chattering, and like poles in the farmyard with barley is scattering, out came the children running, all the little boys and girls, with rosy cheeks and flax and curls, tripping and skipping ran merrily after, the wonderful music was shouting and laughter. The mayor was dumb and the council stood, as if they were changed into blocks of wood, unable to move a step or cry to the children merrily skipping by. Could only follow with an eye the joyous crowd at the back of the back, and how the mayor was on the rack, and the wretched council's brought to be, as the piper turned from the high street, to where the west of its waters break the way of their sons and daughters. However, he turned from south to west, and the couple of our children's steps addressed, and after him the children pressed, great was the joy in every breast. He never could cross the mighty top. He's forced to let the piping drop, and we shall see our children stop. And so they reached the mountainside, a wondrous portal opened wide, as if a cavern was suddenly hollowed. The piper advanced, and the children followed. And when all were in to the very last, the door in the mountainside shut fast. Then I say, oh, no, one was lame, and could not dance the whole of the way. And in after years of his blame, his sadness, he was used to say, it is dull in our town since my playmates left. I can't forget that I am bereft of all the pleasant sights they see, which the piper also promised me. For he led us, he said, to a joyous land, joining the town in jest at hand, where waters gushed and fruit trees grew, and flowers put forth a fairer hue, and everything was strange and new. The sparrow was brighter than peacock here, and their dogs are run our fellow deer, and honeybees had lost their stings. The horses were born with eagles' wings, and just as I became assured, my lame foot would be speedily cured. The music stopped and I stood still, and found myself outside the hill, left behind against my will, to go now limping as before, and never hear of that country more. Alas, alas, for Hamelin, there came into many a burger's pate, a text which says that hope that heaven's gate opes to the rich at as easy rate as the needle's eye takes Hamelin. The mare sent east, west, north, and south to offer the piper by word of mouth, 
wherever it was man's lot to find him, silver and gold to his heart's content. If only he'd return the way he went and bring the children behind him. But when they saw it was lost endeavor, the piper and dancers were gone forever. They made a decree that lawyers never should think their records dated duly, if after the day of the month and year, these words do not as well appear. And so long after what happened here on the 22nd of July, 1376, and the veteran memory fixed the place of the children's last retreat. They called it the Pied Piper Street, where anyone playing pipe or tabor was sure for his future to lose his labor, or suffered a hostile over your cavern to shock the corner of the street so solemn. In opposite the place of the cavern, they wrote the story on a column, and on a great church window painted the same to make the world acquainted how their children were stolen away, and there it stands this very day.